Good afternoon. Um, we'll now commence our annual general meeting. So I would now like to call to order the 2016 annual general meeting of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. Um, you will have opportunity to ask questions at certain points throughout the AGM, and I'd like to quickly go over the procedures for that. During the AGM, we ask that you come to the microphone stand to ask questions. For those of you joining via webcast, click on the Ask a Question button on your screen, and you can then type in your question and submit it and your question will be read in the room on your behalf. Uh, just recall that, you, just a reminder that there is a 40 second delay for things coming in on the webcast. Um, before asking a question, I'd ask that you state your name and affiliation. At the registration area, members received a kit folder and I encourage you to read the materials contained inside, including today's agenda and today's and the annual financial statements. Uh, the full version of the financial statements is available on the website as noted in your package. As a member-based organization, only eligible .ca members may vote. As per CIRA's bylaws and the Not Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, in order to vote during this AGM, you must have been a .ca member 21 days prior to today's annual general meeting and continue as a member as of today. Those eligible members who are joining us via webcast are able to vote and ask questions and will receive instructions for doing so during my presentation. For those of you here in the room, when the vote takes place, we ask that everyone please remain in the room. Eligible members may vote by raising their voting card when a vote is called, and the voting card looks like this. If you are an eligible member, you'll find this card in your kit that you received at check-in. Um, so when you vote, please hold your card up high and hold it there until you're asked to put it down. This is to determine if a majority and if required to ensure that we can count every vote. For those of you joining us via webcast when a vote is called, you'll see the motion appear in a box on the right of your screen. Click on your selection and your vote will be registered. And again, there'll be a delay. So we'll, we'll have to wait in the room until the online registration uh, votes can be tabulated. Um, in accordance with our bylaws, Paul Havey, who is CIRA's Vice President of Corporate Services and Corporate Secretary, will act as Secretary and I will act as Chair. Uh, do we have a quorum in the room? We do. Um, the uh, Corporate Secretary has advised me that we have the required quorum, quorum of 100 members present in the room and online. With that, I declare the meeting duly constituted and we will now proceed with the business at hand. Today's agenda was posted on Sirius AGM website on August 9th, 2016. You also have a copy of it in your kit. Unless I hear any objections, we will proceed with the agenda as distributed. And I'm seeing no objections, so we will move on. Um, so the first, the next item on the agenda is the verification of the 2015 annual general meeting minutes. A copy of the minutes is available in your kits. These minutes were made available to all members through Sirius AGM website on August 9th, 2016. If there are no objections, I will verify the minutes as correct. Seeing no objections, the minutes stand verified. I'd like to begin my report to you by introducing the hardworking members of your board who are in attendance today. Uh, you'll see on the screen a full listing of the members of the board. Uh, I invite each board member please to stand when I say your name so that the 
um, audience can recognize you. Michael Geist, Chair of the Community Investment Committee. Rowena Lang, Chair Finance Audit Investment and Risk Management Committee. Faye West, Chair of the Governance Committee. Rob Villeneuve, Chair of the Market Strategy Committee. Carrie Brown, Andrew Escobar, Louise McDonald, Helen McDonald, Marita Mall, John Demko, and Byron Holland, our President and CEO. I would like to take this opportunity to thank each of these hardworking board members for their insight and contribution to the board of CIRA over this past year. So I'll now take a few minutes just to review some of the major activities and accomplishments that we've been able to achieve this year. Um, Byron's already outlined a number of issues that we've been dealing with this year and the environment in which we've been operating, so I'll try to avoid duplication of commentary. This year has represented something of a pivot point for CIRA. We've closed off on one strategic plan and have spent time this year looking at the future of CIRA and evolving our previous strategic plan to reflect the challenges envisioned in the upcoming three to four year period. As you have heard from Syria previously, the domain industry is in the midst of important change. This year, we saw many of, our previously, many of the previously announced new generic top-level domains come online. There are now more than 1,000 new GTLDs in the market, with extensions like .work, .university, and .xyz becoming more commonplace. Sira's approach to this reality has been both st steady and strategic. The core of Sira's business remains strong. We have just reached 2.5 million domains under management, and job one for Sira continues to be steady and secure operation of the .ca domain name. We need to ensure that Sira has the resources and talent in place to continue to deliver on this core mandate. As with our peers look globally, CIRA is facing a mature market and slowing growth. Although we are performing better than many of our in, in our industry who are now facing negative growth, CIRA needs to diversify its business to ensure that we can continue to fund the .ca domain and other programs at their current levels. As you heard from Byron this morning, we've made significant headway this during this fiscal year. CIRA has taken its leadership and expertise in the registry sp space to create what we believe to be a competitive registry services offering for new GTLDs and smaller country code TLDs. This registry will form the basis of the next generation platform for .ca, while also providing us with potential new revenue streams. You may have noticed this morning that we announced a deal with Doc Kiwi that will see CIRA take over the back end operations of their registry. This work is grow occurring alongside our growing DNS business. We've launched a DNS service that offers robust Canadian server footprint, which increases the level of performance and protection from cyber attack for all Canadian users. We closed out this fiscal year with 86 customers using our DZone Anycast DNS service, providing an additional source of revenue for CIRA, but more importantly, improving the DNS hygiene of these organizations. We've gained traction in the post-secondary education market with many of Canada's research and education networks, including Canary, Orion, Sibera, and Acorn, offering DNS services in partnership with CIRA. We've also announced partnerships with several of our .ca registrar channel partners in order to offer services to their customers. We have announced a deal with .dk, the Danish country code, to offer DNS services, and we've partnered with .se, the Swedish country code, to deliver Anycast DNS services to their customers in Sweden. 
These are major steps in Sears product and revenue diversification strategy. But first and foremost, these efforts support Sears core mandate in meaningful ways. Our registry services platform will enable the next generation of .ca and our DNS development helps protect and secure CIRA against cyber attack. Additionally, the Sears board, CIRA board's market strategy committee has worked with Sears management team to ensure that these projects also benefit the Canadian internet ecosystem at a, at a larger level. You'll find that this theme, <coughs> this is a theme that has been carried through Sears strategic plan for 2017 to 2020. CIRA has considered the ways in which we can leverage our talent and technology to support the internet community in Canada and help build a better online Canada. Part of this work continues to be driven by our board's community investment committee, which oversees CIRA's community investment program. At the end of this fiscal year, CIRA has awarded over $2 million in grants to nonprofit organizations working on internet enabled programs or research projects. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Andy Forrest for his really good presentation this morning as illustrative of some of the good work that those projects are doing to advance the internet in Canada. This year we announced the national launch of a mobile, mobile wayfinding app that find, helps visually impaired ca Canadians navigate Canadian cities using audio-based instructions. The app was de de developed at McGill University and thanks to funding from CIRA is now available for major cities across the country. We funded a program in Ottawa that provided entrepreneurship and e-commerce training to new Canadians who were looking to grow their businesses and gain further financial independence. These are just a very few of the numerous programs we have supported that are having social, economic, and technological impact across the country. Overall, at the end of fiscal 2016, CIRA had supported 54 projects across Canada. The board has just yesterday approved another million dollar investment for this coming year. CIRA's approach to working with the internet community is through partnerships with our customers and with like-minded non-governmental organizations working to improve the Canadian internet experience. You all play a role in ensuring that CIRA has the right mix of ideas and skills to make this happen. CIRA is a member-based organization and our members decide the outcome of our annual election process. We believe that everyone has a right to be informed on the issues facing the internet in Canada and should have their voice heard. As voting opens in Sirius election process today, if you are a member, I strongly encourage you to vote for candidates that you know will do a great job. I encourage you to review Sirius annual report to members, which outlines details on, the pro on these projects and others conducted throughout the year and you can access that report online at www.cira.ca backslash annual report. For anyone interested in further details on CIRA's strategic plan, which is guiding the organization's work for the next three years, you can also find this material on CIRA.ca. It's an exciting time for CIRA, and as Byron has previously described, a critical time for the Canadian internet. CIRA can and will play a positive role in this space, and I encourage you all to get involved. I will now invite Rowena Lang, Chair of the Finance, Audit, Investment, and Risk Management Committee to present the Auditor's Report and Audited Financial Statements for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2016. Rowena. Well, thank you, Susan. I always get this exciting part in pre, uh, presenting the financials. So um, just to uh, um, let you know that the appointment of auditors will follow after my presentation, 
And then after that, I will invite uh, Susan back on the, um, uh, to the mic here to invite questions from the audience. I'm pleased to present an overview of the auditor's report and a summary of the audited financial statement for the fiscal year uh, ending March 31st, 2016 for you today. You can find a full version of the report if you're online, it's uh, uh, on the CIRA website, and if you're at the audience right now, it's in your kit folder. So the FY16 financial statements have been issued with an um, unqualified opinion by the auditor. In lay term, this means that we have a clean audit and that there are no issues um, with the financial statements from the accounting point of view, and that they are full, they fully represent the financial position of the organization. We will discuss the statement of operations first, which is now up on the screen. Um, total revenue for the fiscal year 2016 topped 20 million this year. This is for the first time for this organization. This is 1.1 million increase over the previous fiscal year, with the majority of the um, revenue growth attributable to our traditional domain registration um, business. Domain registration, the DUM, increased approximately by 96,000 domain names over the level of the previous year. This represents 4.1% domain under management uh, growth in the fiscal year 16. CIRA has, has been experiencing this single-digit DUM growth for a number of years now, and this is um, consistent with the global trend um, and also very consistent with other top-level CCTLDs. Our product diversification strategy has begun to bear fruit with our sponsorship and other revenue at $104,000 in fiscal year 16. This is 4.7% more than the previous fiscal year. Um, the large rep the, the, this largely represents uh, sales traction from our D-Zone, which was mentioned a number of times, uh, DNS service, where significant inroads have been made in the research, education, and network segment, and also in uh, the Canadian Internet exchange points. At the end of the year, Sierra had 86 uh, unique customer relationships, and I think Byron said that right now we're up to 126, and that this is the relationship that we have never had before. And these um, um, customers are now uh, on our, our own managed global DNS infrastructure, and they are being served on this, and this wasn't um, even available uh, 12 months ago. This effectively serves our broader mandate, as, as, as mentioned again, that um, to build a better internet um, online Canada, while also providing us with the opportunity to diversify our revenue. Total operating expenditure, the expenses is up there, yeah. Total uh, operating expenditure is $21 million, which is comparable to the level of the previous fiscal year. In FY16, the most significant area of change and underlying expenditure occurs in the salary and benefits, computer operations network, consulting, and also office and admin. Additional eight, uh, human resources capacity was added. We added five new positions in the development area and also in mar uh, uh, marketing and communication. Salaries and benefits increased approximately 800,000 over the previous years and our expenditure on computer operations and network increased approximately 600,000. Reflecting our four years expenditure relating to DNS infrastructure development, as well as costs related to the new um, production data center site. Office and admin um, was also, um, also had a 700,000, uh, sorry, office, in general, was seven actually seven hundred thousand dollars lower than the previous year, with the exclusion of the one time um, we had to pay off our lease, surrender our lease for the previous premise. Consulting declined approximately seven hundred thousand dollars compared to the previous fiscal year. So, in fiscal year two thousand and sixteen, Sierra invested one point three million in our community investment program. 
And this is represent about 6.6% of our revenue in support of our broader mandate to assist Canada um, to build a better uh, online Canada. Investment were made in three areas. The most significant one is our uh, uh, $1 million funds uh, under the Community Investment Program. And this is the second year that we invested more than a million dollars in the um, CIAP. We funded 29 worthy grant recipients um, this, this, this go around. We also invested in the Canadian Internet Forum, which provides a venue for members and interested shareholders to provide their input into issues that is affecting the internet governance and the internet ecosystem. We also further facilitated community development work and enhanced our internet exchange points. During FY16, Sierra earned $300,000 in investment income. The fair value of our investment holding fluctuate day, uh, based upon market conditions. Any fluctuation in the values are recorded and reflected as unrealized gain or unrealized loss in our statements of operation. CIRA ended the year with an anticipated operating deficit of um, just about half a million dollars. And this is, again, our conscious decision of the board to invest in uh, our capacity. Now let's turn our attention to the balance sheet. A slide will change. Okay. On the asset section, you will notice that um, the current asset decreased by a million dollars, but the, our, our capital asset increased by 1.1 million. And this is attributable to our investment in our new premises and also upgrades to our uh, DNS infrastructure. On the liability side of the balance sheet, we have accounts payable, thanks. Customer deposit, current portion of the deferred revenue, as well as the current portion of lease inducement. Overall, the current li liability decreased by about 400,000, while long-term liabilities increased by 900,000. This is largely reflective again because of the lease um, inducement on our new premise. The most significant change is the aggregate $700,000 increase in our current and long-term position um, of the deferred revenue. Deferred revenue total is now at 19.5 million, which is compared to 18.8 in our previous fiscal year. Deferred revenue, as a reminder, is uh, represent unearned revenue, and that it's serious obligation to provide future service to our registrants. Serious net asset decreased by 500,000, as we mentioned earlier, over the pre previous fiscal year, and this is fully anticipated in our budget. This is consistent with our decision to intentionally run a small deficit, operating deficit, while building serious organization capacity and reinvesting in our core infrastructure. And this is certainly proved to be a prudent um, decision, as you can see that our product and services area is beginning to bear fruit. CIRA ended the fiscal year with our three-year strategic plan in a very solid financial position. We have um, 8.5 million in net asset and a robust global DNS infrastructure and also started a very state-of-the-art registration platform which serves CIRA in future needs and also it can be leveraged as part of our product diversification strategy. So this concludes my presentation um, of the 2016 financial statement. Thank you for your attention and I'll invite Susan back to the mic here. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Rowena. Okay, so we, um, that concludes Rowena's presentation of the financial statements, but there will be opportunity to ask questions at a later time. Um, we'll, we'll turn now to the matter of the appointment of the auditor. Um, KPMG has agreed to serve as CIRA's auditors until the next annual general meeting. 
Does anybody have a specific question with respect to the appointment of auditors? I'm not seeing any questions. Um, then I'll call for a motion to reappoint KPMG as series auditors. The motion reads as follows, that KPMG be appointed as auditors of CIRA to hold office until the next annual general meeting or until their successors are duly appointed and that the board of directors be authorized to establish the remuneration of the auditors. Could somebody please make this motion? Could you uh, state your name please, Kerry? Thank you, Kerry. And could we have a seconder for this motion? Helen? Helen McDonald seconds the motion. Uh, are there any further questions or discussions surrounding the motion? Seeing none, eligible members may vote by raising their voting card when a vote is called. If you're an eligible member, you'll find this card in your AGM kit you received at check-in today and I think I've already shown it to you. Um, when you vote, please hold the card up high until you're asked to put it down because we need to uh, do a count of the, of the cards. Um, and for those of you joining via webcast, when a vote is called, you'll see the question appear to the right of the video. Please click on your selection and your vote will be automatically registered, though there will be a delay before I see it. Um, we may now proceed with the vote. Will all those in favor please raise your voting card now? And if you're on the webcast, will you please vote now? Uh, there seems to be a pretty clear majority in the room. Um, so I think you could put your cards down and I'll wait until I see the online votes which are still being collected. Forty seconds is a really long time. <laughs> and, and it flashes at me, collecting online votes. <laughs> Okay, well, while we're waiting for this to, I'll, I'll just take a, um, a moment to remind you to check out the annual report to members that, that you have a copy of. Um, you'll also find a letter from Byron in your kit that outlines a few of the key themes uh, that are highlighted in the report. Um, but if you're interested in getting updates on CIRA's product development, team, team building efforts, or community investment work, uh, the report's a good place to start. Uh, but there is additional information on the website also. Gee, it's a simple question. <laughs> okay, they're coming up now. Uh, slowly. Okay, um, motion, the motion is carried. Uh, KPMG will serve as CIRA's auditors until the next annual general meeting. Thank you. Um, we'll now move to the second um, matter, which is a member's resolution confirming uh, director's amendments to section 3.06 of CIRA's amended and, and restated bylaw number one. Uh, this has to do with term limits of directors. On June 16th, 2016, the board adopted changes to section 3.06 of series amended and restated bylaw number one. The information about these changes were posted on series AGM website on August 9th, 2016. The changes relate to term limits for directors. Uh, previously, we had no term limits for directors. The amended bylaw imposes term limits for directors. 
Um, and to put it in context, director's terms at CIRA are currently three years. The term limit consists of three consecutive three-year terms, or in other words, nine consecutive years. After this period, a director will be required to take a one-year absence from the board before resuming office on the board. The one year of absence on the board is described in the bylaw as the period between the end of the director's last term, which typically ends in uh, sometime in October of the um, end of their third year. So the terms start in October and they end in October until the following election period. I would note that in determining the length of service of a director, service prior to the coming coming into force of these bylaw changes is excluded. So uh, before we move to any questions or comments, may I have a motion to confirm the member's resolution? Uh, yes, Faye, you, thank you. Um, okay. May I have somebody second the motion, please? Gentleman in red. Could I have your name? I'm sorry, I can't see. Peter Bernier. Peter Bernier. Thank you, sir. Um, now we will open the floor to any questions and discussion of the motion. Um, if you could line up at the microphones, it's probably the best way to approach this. Um, and I'll call on you one at a time. And if you're joining on the webcast, your question will be read in the room on your behalf when it appears on the screen. Uh, before asking your question, could you state your name and affiliation? And as this is a meeting of CIRA members, I ask only members to participate in this portion of the meeting. Um, and if the question has been asked or posed already, I'd ask you to refrain from asking it again. Yes. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm David Michaels. I'm an e-commerce entrepreneur based here in Toronto, and I'm also a leader of Tech Entrepreneurs, a meetup group of 1,500 members based in Toronto. And I, I lead this group to further their businesses without compensation whatsoever. So my question is, well, I don't think it's a good idea to allow entrenched um, directors who've already been on the slate for eight years to be, continue on for another nine years. Um, it's not in the materials, so this is a surprise to most people, but it's on the website. Um, starting the, the, the new term limits would start today for another nine years. And some people have been on the board already for eight years. Some people have been on there for six years. I think it's a long time. I think it's time to get some new blood on the, on the slate. Okay, um, I, I'll respond to your question, if I may then. Sure. Um, the intent behind the grandfathering um, was not, was because we were making a change, was to make it a prospective change. In other words, not to impose new rules on people who had previously stood for election under an old set of rules. That being said, um, you know, we, d we certainly did consider this. Um, so I'd ask you to put it a little bit in context in that we have a three-year election cycle. The objectives on the board are to provide for both the benefit derived from the learning curve of the elected directors by serving for some period of time and also to allow for rejuvenation of the board. But ultimately, it is the members that decide whether a board member is elected or re-elected. So therefore, um, the thought was to not impose new rules on existing members, but to permit the members to decide in their voting process as to whether a board member had uh, a, served a sufficient amount of time and whether the overall composition of the board was reflective of their perception as to what the 
rejuvenation of the board as well as the continuity gained from experience, whether that balance was appropriate. So that was the nature of the discussion that went into the grandfathering um, provision. And I would also point out that one of the reasons, we actually haven't had an issue, um, at least not in my memory or knowledge, of board members serving for very long periods of time, um, either because they choose not to or because the members don't reelect them or because they are not nominated. So this is not a burning platform um, motion to amend these bylaws, but rather something that it was thought to reflect best practices, it would be best to initiate when it was not a time of urgency. So I, ho I hope that clarifies the issue and the thinking of the board on bringing this motion forward. It does, but I would limit it to two terms. And Pardon? I would, I would limit it to two terms, not three terms of three years. Well, and the, and the board also looked at the issue of how long that should be and whether it should be two terms or three terms. Mm -hmm. Given the three-year election cycle mm -hmm. and how many board members that we lose each year, and looking at the past performance, we did feel that uh, the learning curve and the considerable benefit of having a degree, though not a hundred percent, of experience on the board made nine years a more suitable term limit for this board. Um, and I think you'll find that generally conversation around best practices would range somewhere between six and nine years for a, a suitable term limit. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions or comments? Yes? Why doesn't he make that a motion? Uh, it, the, to to the modify. Motion, the motion rises or falls. Um, the motion rises or falls. It is not to the meeting to amend the motion. So the members vote on the motion as it is. If it's defeated, it's taken away. Yes, sir. Russell Sutherland from the University of Toronto. Uh, could you expand on the idea of the three-year sabbatical? I assume... Oh, one year. One year, one year. I assume that will allow the clock to get reset for logically nine more years. Yes. Could you, ex could you expand on why that was there rather uh, than... We, we did a little look into, into best practices and um, it seemed that a one-year hiatus was... Nor normally what was found, I, in my experience, very few board members take one year and come back and reapply, but it could happen. Um, so we felt one year was sufficient. And of course, I would again remind you, we do have a nominating committee process and the members ultimately determine whether they think a board member should be reelected, whether or not they have taken a one year hiatus. Are there any other questions or comments? Actually, on this I just want to make a comment as a former board member who had been on for I think ten or nine to ten. I think the nine makes sense. Um, and also, I would like to remind people that there is a nominating committee, and as a former board member, they've never picked me again. So the odds of somebody who's already been on six or seven or or nine years. Uh, getting renominated might be unlikely, though they they could run in the members if they wanted they, they to. So could, there is they could, there is that option. So it, it it is you know it seems to be reasonable though. When you first said you know we would not sort of we would grandfather it, I I was concerned, but then I remember there was a nominating. Well, committee. and that's a good point because yeah. the nominating committee is in fact another check and balance right. on on term limits. Oh, I'm sorry. Th thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't either. So. Uh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Ron Kotrick. I was uh, on the board from 2000 to around 2010. So, Thank you. Thank you. My apology. Um, the nom I, I was about to say another check and balance in this system, for those of you that are not aware, is the nominating committee. And the nominating committee is a committee that is independent of the board uh, and deliberates without the board uh, board representation. Uh, so the nominating committee, of course, has its own views, and the nominating committee changes from time to time every year. 
And it has its own views on term limits, and so it has its own criteria whereby it determines who it nominates. Uh, that deals with the three members that are elected each year from the nominating committee slate. And then there is the member slate, uh, which has a requirement for shows of support. So uh, on balance, uh, I think the board was of the view that there are sufficient checks and balances uh, that a overly stringent or overly onerous uh, term limit was not required. So having said that, um, are there any further comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, then I think we will proceed. <laughs> now I've lost track of where I'm at, sorry. So we will proceed with the um, with the motion. I'm sorry, I just sort of flipped out of order here. We will now proceed with the vote. Um, so would all those in favor please raise your voting card now? And if you're on the webcast, would you please vote now? Uh, that looks like a majority in the room, so you could put your cards down and we'll wait for the votes to be cast online. Pardon? For a dissent, you mean? Um, I don't believe I am. Ne neither have I, but. <laughs> Um, okay, um, we, we c let me uh, get some input into that. Is Albert about? Yeah, we just need a pure majority. Um, well, I don't know what it is yet <laughs> because I'm waiting. I, d I do get the number voting online and the number voting for. No, I, all I get is whether there's a peer majority. If, any, if anybody wishes to register a dissent, I would be prepared to accept that. Okay. Okay, we have three, regi three registered dissents in the room. Okay. Um, we will also have to call for dissents online then. I don't think this is on. But we'll have yes. to wait for the vote first. Uh, just to help pass the time, since there's a 40 minute window, I wouldn't have normally asked this. Or okay. 40, 40 minute, 40 second. 40 second window is, um, I, uh, I'm Josh Leslie and uh, I'm a social entrepreneur. Um, I just want to make sure if this had to be retyped or whether it was copied and pasted because it says lengthy of, ter of service under C instead of length of service. So I think it's probably taken care of in the actual document, but since it's not in the folders, I just want to. Yeah, okay, thank you for pointing that out. I don't believe it has to be um, retyped because it's a non-substantive matter. Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, I know many of you in the room are not presently members of CIRA, but um, I'll use this time to remind you that there's an opportunity to become a member of CIRA at this meeting. Uh, we have currently 14,500 members who get to vote uh, for our board of directors and attend events similar to the ones you're at today. Uh, we hold member events in various towns in various years. Uh, so if you are sitting here wishing that you were participating, um, our CIRA staff would be happy to help set up your membership out in the lobby after the meeting. Um, if you know of other people with .ca domains who might like to get involved with CIRA, please tell them about us. 
um, and encourage them to also join our organization. I think we're getting close. Um, Albert, from a technical perspective, I'm not sure if how online people can register dissent. Okay. Okay, the majority online have also supported the motion, so the motion is carried. Yes, sir. Uh, Chair, what did you uh, 20, and I think, I can't recall how many were online now, I've forgotten. Could, 34? <coughs> Sorry. 34 online, 20 voted for it? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, William Stratus from Toronto. I just, a little patience and, and maybe explain. I, I respect the people at this table, none of whom I know. But to be clear, did the online vote permit a negative response? No. It did? Yes. Were there any votes against? Uh, five. Five okay. against? So let's understand something. We are changing a fundamental governance provision, I believe, in the bylaw, correct? Yes. It's a bylaw change. Okay, so this is the least opportune moment to be expedient. I'll be frank, okay? Okay. So I'm actually surprised that there seems to be some confusion about the vote. We should simply have a total, how many in affirmative and how many negative. We are changing fundamentals of governance. So I would think that the negative option should be respected, even if it's a, mi a minority of three people or two or three. Uh, this is not North Korea. So we should just, everybody should have an equal say, yes or no, and it should be transparent. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I believe I did uh, allow for the dissenting votes to be counted. Okay. Um, in order to give you definitive totals, I would have to ask those in the room to raise their cards again. However, the motion has been carried at this point, so I respect your point and we'll take it into consideration when we organize a vote in the future. That's really all I can do with it because to now ask everyone to put their cards back up could result in change votes and we already have a carried motion. I 100% accept that as a matter of pragmatics, okay? But as a matter of governance, this is not a, this is not a good procedure has been demonstrated. And, and your point is Thank registered. You. Thank you. Thank you for raising that point. Okay, we will move on now. Um, and, and my apologies to those of you who may feel offended. Um, I have followed the procedure as outlined in our rules and has been historically followed. But I take the gentleman's point, so we'll amend that procedure. Um, so we'll now proceed to general questions from members. And again, I would ask people to line up at one of the microphones in the aisles. Um, if you're on the webcast, please post your question for the moderator to relay to us in the room. Please state your name and affiliation before asking the question. As this is a meeting of members, we'll start by taking questions from members and we'll keep an eye on the clock. And if additional time permits, we'll entertain other questions. Um, could somebody let me know how much time we in fact have so that I can... Okay. I'm guessing... I'm guessing we have 15 to 20 minutes. 
Um, I think you were there first, so I'll take your question first. Thank you, Madam Chair. William Stratus from Toronto. I've been a member for a long time. Um, welcome back to Toronto. I noted with some dismay that last year's meeting, nobody asked questions, according to the... That's correct. I cannot believe that. <laughs> And, and I guess you should I, have come to Vancouver. No, no, no. <laughs> it's the West Coast mentality. So welcome to Toronto because we're not letting you out that quickly. So I did come with about eight questions and I respect the fact there's other people, but I would like perhaps the opportunity since I am on target with these on, on topic, maybe I can cycle back with some. I'll, t I'll, I'll start off with one I gave Mr. Holland a preview of. Um, uh, he made mention in his comments very specifically about opening up enterprise opportunities, enterprise revenue. Now, in your comments, Madam Chair, you specifically referenced in the spon on page four of the report, sponsorship and other revenue, and you quoted that other revenue represented enterprise revenue for the fiscal period. Is that correct? And it was around $104,000. Is, is my, my there point... There might be something else in there, too. But okay, okay, well, it says and other, <laughs> and other revenue, but I, I'm sort of concerned, or at least maybe it's a question of transparency. There should be an extra revenue line. It should say enterprise activities or enterprise operations if you're opening up uh, this new diversified stream. Uh, it would be nice to see exactly where, because it sounds like, the, from the chair anyway, there's a high opportunity seen there for diversification of revenue, and yet it's not broken out, even as small as it may be. It, it's very small. Well, it, I, in that fiscal year, it's very small. And yet it's a major highlight of the keynote, so there's kind of a, a dichotomy there. Um, uh, I am a little concerned as well about uh, the market strategy committee and whether it properly assessed what I would consider the commercial risks of selling enterprise product to enterprise customers with all sorts of risks attached potentially. It does diverge somewhat from the not-for-profit mandate. Uh, that's not for me to judge necessarily, but uh, there is some concern perhaps about the risk channels you, op you open even as you open revenue channels. So, so maybe you could comment a little on that. Could uh, perhaps I reframe that because we're listening to questions. Uh, your question is, um, what has the, specifically the product strategy committee uh, undertaken in terms of its due diligence and, and the board itself? Well, perhaps that's a more general question. The real specific question was it's not, it's not broken out. And I think it's not transparent for the members to see where the, the uh, direction of the corporation is going in terms of its revenue. So... Uh, okay, well, I, I would suggest it's not broken out because it's not material, um, so which I think is apparent from the financial statements, that, it, that the revenues in 2016 are not material. So the auditor made that decision, or was that a management presentation issue? Um, you're citing from the annual report, yeah, I think. There's a more four. detailed report on the website. I'm sorry, okay. I think. I don't know. Yeah, well, go have a look, and yeah, I'm sure you'll let me know. Um, and, and I'll respond to your question um, with respect to the, um, you've characterized them as enterprise activities. Um, I think when Byron spoke, he highlighted the issue that the CIRA, that CIRA is facing, and that is the flatlining of the domain registrations and therefore revenues. So um, we have a shop that, you know, has technical expertise. And so the board looked at this. Actually, it was in the strategic plan of three years ago. We've been working on this initiative for three years already, at least three years. Um, and we had to build capacity, both in terms of personnel and infrastructure, um, and it's been a, a slow build, let's put it that way. So one of the things that the board was extremely clear about was that any such initiative had to pass two threshold tests. First of all, it certainly needed to be within our purposes, which are the operation of the registry in Canada and to do things that promote the internet in Canada. I'm paraphrasing. Um, so things to advance the internet in Canada. 
The board was also extremely concerned about the impact on the stakeholders, notably the registrars and other stakeholders. So the product market strategy committee was formed, I think it, this is its third year, roughly its third year now. Um, and the, part of its mandate was to determine that appropriate filters were in place in order to ensure that projects undertaken, first of all, met those objectives, that is, they fell within our purposes, and that they advanced the state of the internet in Canada, and that they also did not constitute a competitive threat to our stakeholders. And then beneath that were the, th the other filters that you're discussing. And those were things like, what kind of opportunity does this represent? Is this a business case? Is most of the cost or the work that goes into it something that CIRA would be engaging in in any event to enhance our own infrastructure? And what type of risks are we undertaking? And you mentioned one or two of them. And are those risks manageable? And how big a risk are they? So my response to you would be that the board is satisfied that the committee has done that work and in fact uh, the board um, endorsed the filter that was brought forward at yesterday's board meeting which has not been a hasty process to get that done. Um, so I, my, my response to you would be yes, I think the board has done all due diligence around this um, and I don't think it's done. I think it's a continuous effort. As new concepts and new ideas come online, this filter will be applied before any advance is taken. There's right. also the jump off. You start something and it doesn't quite turn out the way you thought it would. Right. So how do we decide when to jump off? And that also has been under due consideration. Thank you. Did the board rely on any external guidance, such as professionals, on assessing those risks or those opportunities? Is there any external input to the we, board? We did not hire an external consultant. Okay, why not? Uh, we didn't feel it was necessary. We felt that we had the expertise at this stage. That's not to say we never would, but we think at this stage that we had the expertise um, so you mean expertise within the board itself, within its own the, skill set? W w within the board and within, within the management group. The organization, group. yes. Um, because we are talking at this stage largely about process. Well, I would suggest there needs to be a lot of care and concern at that stage. There, there, there this. is. Um, we formulated a special committee just for this purpose. Um, as we, much as you build the organization, it can get destroyed by all sorts of forces. So Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> As I'm aware. Okay. And I have one quick follow-up, if I may, and it is much briefer. It, does the board have a formal investment policy? You mentioned in, yes. you was referencing. Is yes, that it published? Does. Is that yes, published? Yes, it does. Uh, no, it is not, um, and the board will be considering that a member, uh, somebody, it's my understanding, uh, somebody running for election asked for a copy of it. Is there an ethical component to the investment policy, or, you know, some of this is... Uh, no. I believe that there isn't. Could we get that published at some point? Yes, it's our intention to review it um, and to take a decision about its publication at the next board meeting. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to this side of the room and then I'll go to the uh, online if, okay. Sure. Uh, Josh Leslie of Stewart Lee. Um, so my question harkens back to the panel discussion earlier and the talk around submarine fiber optic cables sort of running direct from Canada, so versus going down through the US and, and across the existing cables. Basically, my question is twofold. So one is, is there any place to find out information about like what exists, if anything? And the second part of it is, what is or would be CIRA's role in, in administering, driving sort of um, an agenda around getting some of those established um, just any, any general comments or insights around how to find information about that and then what Sierra's role and perhaps other kind of player's role might be in that. Okay, I'm going to punt your question to Byron. <laughs> Five. 
Thanks for the question. Uh, submarine cables are a little bit outside of our bailiwick. Uh, <laughs> there is a very good website that lists and locates geographically all underwater uh, fiber cables globally, including to Canada. I can't remember the name of it. Telegeography. Telegeography. And it shows you all the landing points um, and, quite frankly, how few underwater cables we have landing on Canadian shore. Well, we have one, zero on the west coast, one on the east coast. Okay, um, I'll go to the online question because it's been sitting here quite a while. Um, the question reads, I understand your wish for continuity within the board and appreciate your explanation behind changing this prospectively. Can you provide a rough estimate of the average tenure of the current board members? I'm reluctant to do that off the top of my head, but Albert, could you um, provide me with that? Yeah. This doesn't answer the question exactly, but in my tenure as CEO over eight years, I've had 34 board members on a 12-member board. So that gives you a sense of the turnover and the refresh rate. Uh, as a CEO, I would suggest that a significant turnover. Yeah, and as a board chair, for now coming into my fourth year, I would suggest that the turnover is fairly significant also. Um, I think you were next, sir. I think, I think she was next, actually. Was she? Okay. Yeah. I'm Gillian Savetchko, and I've been a member for many years, and a minor entrepreneur in respect to what these, everybody here seems to be. However, I'm very interested in the direction of the internet, and I would like to have some direction from the board as to the consideration of how or if you, you are going to have any part in keeping the internet free. In other words, no government controls, you can't do this, you can't do that, you know, it's, it's just growing because it's our last me communication method worldwide where we can actually discuss anything on the internet. Okay. There's I been a lot of talk about that in the media um, and online. Okay, I'm having a little trouble with the question, so yeah. um, maybe you can, can you reframe it a little bit for me? I'm sorry. Okay. There's a lot of discussion on the internet, especially yes. by governments, of taking control of the management of the of the of the CN of the of the internet, I would like to know what CA, the CA is thinking of in that direction. Okay. Um, or if it comes your, under yours. Is your question whether um, whether CIRA would intend to engage in lobbying activities vis-a-vis? -vis? No, not no? necessarily lobbying. Just if you have any intention or have you even looked at it in that respect? I'd just like to have a, a sense of where CIRA stands on. The, the c consideration of a free internet. Okay, um, I'm gonna let Byron take a shot at that and, and I may add something to it after he's done that. I'm gonna make an assumption that when you say there's been a lot of media attention lately, uh, it's vis-a-vis -vis the US election, Senator Ted Cruz talking about uh, the oversight transition from the U.S. government into other government hands, and it's becoming highly politicized. Yes. That's what's in the media a lot right now. Yeah, and it goes even further back than that. Huh? Sure. So I would say that um, CIRA, for all time or most time, has been a very strong proponent of a free, open, permissionless, borderless internet. Full stop. Yeah, I would also say that uh, while I have nothing to do with government per se, they have been strong proponent, Canadian government have been strong proponents in the global internet ecosystem of the same. Uh, but I certainly don't speak for them. It's just an observation of what they say. Yeah. Um, what is happening in terms of what's being reported on the media right now to a very great degree has been blown significantly out of proportion because the transition that's happening in actual fact is a very, very specific technical function that's being talked about, and it's been blown out of all proportion for partisan political domestic gain in the U.S. election season. So I would say anything you read on that, take it with a very large grain of salt at this point. 
Google. However, if you check my blog, there are the <laughs> I will. <facts. laughs> I will do There that. you can find the absolute undisputed truth, of course. Yeah. Um, but it, I do, I do uh, deal with the specific issue in significant detail and yeah. real facts. And, and where, it, where it all started was with a crime that's being committed through the internet and, and uh, immorality and all that kind of stuff. But hey, if you start cutting down something, you're going to lose all our freedoms. And so, no. <laughs> Thank you. Sir? Russell Sutherland, University of Toronto. Um, a great big plug uh, for uh, D-Zone. Great service, a uh, great job that your team has done in implementing that. Fantastic service, thank you. Uh, technical question. Uh, I know that uh, Sierra, just from the panel, uh, great um, proponent of DNSSEC for security. At the same time, one of the chief security problems would be the denial of service attack. Um, to what extent did CIRA, the technical team, balance out the fact that itself DNSSEC is a huge source of denial of service attacks? So provides one degree of security and yet at the same time allows for a massive, perhaps the greatest uh, source of denial of service. And did you, did you look at any other ways of making DNS a bit more secure than DNSSEC? So, technical question, but... No, it's a technical question, and uh, who should we have respond to that technical question? Jacques. <laughs> Jacques, is he here? Is Jacques in the room? Steven? <laughs> Steven actually leads our IT group both on the dev and operations side. Hi there. Um, without getting into significant technical detail and in my hallmark way of keeping my comments brief, um, <laughs> we are aware of DNSSEC as being a vector for attack for DDoS. Uh, we work with the IETF and with ICANN on various expert panels to ensure that we we strike the right balance in the international community for defending against that attack. Uh, as for the defense of DDoS in general, we maintain a defense in depth architecture with our DZone product that allows for us to pull several levers of soaking DDoS attacks as they occur so that we can protect various parts of our infrastructure. It's a highly sophisticated engineering, but it's one that has proven in the last couple of years to be very, very effective. If you want to get into the technical details, we can take it offline and I can get a little more specific with you, but given the room, I think that's a sufficient response. It's a reasonable response, thank, thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Okay. Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Helmer. I'm a member of CIRA. I own two domains, and day-to-day uh, I'm, -day I'm president of HMGI, which is the short form for Helmer Management Group International. Uh, what we do, we're market revenue generators. We help companies and organizations launch branded product, service, program, and event because those are the four buckets of what things people sell in order to create revenue in their organizations. So my perspective in looking at the annual report kind of flagged a couple of things. and. Please, uh, I would say to the board, these comments are not meant to be antagonistic in any way or to counter what you've been doing, but just to add some further perspective of things you might want to think about. Um, you've highlighted in your report and as the board chair as well as the CEO that uh, we are now flatlining in terms of our registration of .ca um, domains. And that means that your revenues are going to become somewhat restricted. Uh, in the future if there isn't a huge stimulus with a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon to buy new domains. Um, that in most organizations, particularly not-for-profit organizations, would be grounds for panic <laughs> because you've really got to bring to the marketplace new opportunities for revenue generation or you could easily backslide in terms of revenue and rather quickly, particularly if some security risks arose that, uh, that perhaps were beyond your control, but they reverberated on you. So one of the questions uh, that, that I had, um, 
I noticed in most annual reports, there is usually a five or 10 year horizon of uh, revenues and expenses and the bottom line position so that people can see a trend through time as to how is the organization fared. Um, I noticed in this report uh, there was no such history and I wondered if we could ask the board um, beginning with next year if they would uh, discuss this and publish one for perspective. Bec and, and the point I'm trying to underline is this, is if one was to just take a look at the two years that are presented here, in both years we've had a deficiency of revenues and we've lost money and that might well be appropriate in terms of investment it, when, of some particular initiatives you've been taking and, and prudent. And it's intentional. It's intentional. It is intentional. Uh, yes, you've made that very clear. The, the question is, in the context of time, uh, you know, should there then be a move away from that intentional point to bringing it into balance? Um, and one can't judge that if only one I, sees I would two refer years. you to the strategic plan to see that intention to move away. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine. So my first question is, would the board uh, please insert into next year's annual report uh, a five or 10 year history of the revenues of the association so we can see you know, how it has undulated and changed. The other thing that uh, pops out to me in looking at this annual report uh, and the question I would pose is, um, has the board given any consideration to um, putting a contingency line into your budget where a certain percentage of funds are not spent they are held in, um, in reserve so that an accumulation of monies is there. Under your not-for-profit charter terms, I assume that that's not an issue from a taxation standpoint, so long as the ultimate use of those monies, be it this year or any other year, goes back to the purposes of the organization, you're, you're therefore not vulnerable by doing that. In fact, you're providing a bit of a protective envelope. So, have they given any consideration to that in the past and will they do so in the future? Um, in, in a sense, I think it's built into our finances in the sense you'll note that we're, we have run a, a significant surplus over the past years. Mm -hmm. We don't spend that surplus on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. And so part of the strategy is that some of that surplus at this appropriate time uh, over the initiative that started about three years ago mm -hmm. um, should be used to build the capacity of the organization. Mm -hmm. So, um, and from a financial statement reporting perspective, I don't believe we'd report a contingency in the expenditure uh, column. We use it as, a, now, now I appreciate your comments and the comments of many other people. Mm -hmm. And what I will undertake to do is to seriously look, um, have the board seriously look and management um, at our annual report and whether it um, is sufficiently informative and modern over the coming year with a view to making, I've heard numerous suggestions for possible revisions to it. Mm -hmm. So I, I will undertake to do that to perhaps provide better information. Thank you. I, I think if these two years were put in the context of the longer term horizon, we would see the exact point you've made. Yeah, and I think that's an a, a trend in, in annual reporting is to provide um, a little more uh, fulsome historical context. Yes, thank you. Uh, my final question is this. Um, given that next year is Canada's 150th birthday and .ca is uniquely Canadian, I'm wondering if the board would consider creating some sort of an ad hoc committee uh, with perhaps board members as well as staff members in combination to somehow stimulate a competition that would invite .ca owners to um, put forward uh, their websites uh, as nominations under various categories that you would define as here are wonderful examples of how you can use .ca to promote whatever you're promoting with your domain. Uh, it might be in categories of things like sport or history or whatever categories or, or citizenship or whatever you might want to come up. But I think it might do a lot to uh, stop the backslide of people deregistering domains because they acquired them at one time, they sat on them for a while and then they let them go. If, if people are actively using them, then of course they won't relinquish them. Uh, the only thing they possibly do is maybe sell it to someone else. But I think an ad hoc committee that would stimulate that sort of a contest 
would do a lot to highlight the existence of CIRA and the importance of the .co domain. So is that something the board would consider? That, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. We'll, we'll take that under consideration. Um, but just to point out, actually, our domain registrations are not backsliding. Um, they're just not growing as fast as they used to. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but we certainly will take that suggestion. It's a great suggestion. Thank you. thank you for making it. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Ron Kochuk again, I, former board member. Um, today I heard a couple of interesting things that kind of got me thinking. Um, the current internet is this IPv4 thing that's kind of the internet of people, because a lot of people use it. Um, and it's really a north-south network. And Paul and Byron and a few others would love to see this IPv6 grow and be the Internet of Things. And to, as far as I know, things don't need to communicate over huge distances. Uh, they got to get to the local repairman or the local Coke vendor to re replace their thing. So would it make sense for CIRA to actually spearhead a Canadian IPv6 network? Because you're then, you know, you're building a whole new highway and you're not dependent on the old highway. Just just a suggestion based on the random thoughts I heard today, and they were quite interesting. Um, and I do have one other comment, and that is you do have a huge contingency fund. It's $20 million, I think. Mm -hmm. but we you just only don't call it but that. You only <laughs> earn, but you only earn 291000 on it, and I, I'm the treasurer of a condo, and I earn a lot better return on that on GICs. So. Yeah, well, if you looked at the investment policy, <laughs> coupled with the bond and uh, equity markets over the last little while, uh, and we will be posting the yeah. investment policy. It, it, it just seems to be fairly low compared to yeah, there's a what variety you could potentially of do. reasons for it. Yeah. yeah, with zero risk. Okay, thank you. We seem to have a queue developing. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's David, and I'm from the Niagara region. I have a question with regard to the. Um, uh, go-to-market strategy that CIRA has implemented, it appears from my perspective that the, the, the focus of the CIRA business strategy is at the technology end of the internet and that very little effort has been put into analyzing the end user and with human behavior and how they use technology, interact with the web. Um, I was wanting to know two questions. One. Does the organization have any kind of an accessibility strategy plan they want to implement that engages the end user? Um, you talk about flatline registration, you talk about low levels of membership engagement, and I think that there needs to be some kind of strategy, accessibility strategy within the business plan to engage users. Accessibility is really a measurement of productivity where people use products and services, their satisfaction, their level of productivity, and of course, it affects pr major impact on accessibility standards on people with disabilities. So the question is, what is the accessibility plans going forward that affect the end user? And the second question is, why is the board of directors have no advisors on there that represent the disabled community when Stats Canada shows that one out of seven Canadians have a disability and one out of five Canadians, if you consider health and aging, it has a, some sort of a significant disability. So you need some kind of an advisor that represents that major market sector, not only for strategy, but human resources. Okay, um, I think um, your, your second point is a, is a suggestion. Um, I do find it quite complimentary that we don't have any elderly people on the board. This is great. Um, but, <laughs> but, but it's true. We don't have a, a strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, persons of dis with disabilities. And um, we, we will incorporate that into our upcoming discussion. Um, it's a constant challenge for us at CIRA to identify our stakeholders, the most significant of which is our members, and the value proposition to our members and the appropriate forms of communication. And it's been a topic of ongoing discussion, um, 
and it's about to become a more pointed discussion because it's on the agenda for the upcoming year uh, to try to better um, identify how we a communicate out to our members better but how we also receive more timely and ongoing communication from our members which I think turns to your subject of accessibility and correct me if you think I haven't understood your question correctly um, but it certainly is top of mind for the board at this time and certainly will be the subject of some considerable discussions this year not to say that it wasn't top of mind in the past, but it seems to have been slow coming to resolution. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Ward. I own ryanward.ca, ryansworld.ca, and canadianshieldmagazine.ca. Uh, I just wanted to, there were, are, I made a couple of suggestions online to um, info at cra.ca about uh, a couple of things with the program and things like that, uh, such as publishing more information uh, for board, or for the board meetings and stuff like that. But I wanted to suggest with regards to, uh, we had constitu or we had bylaw amendments and things. Uh, it would be good to have more information up front about uh, the all of like having the actual uh, bylaws, not just the amendments, but the entire bylaws available with the bylaw amendments that uh, on the main page, and then um, a few other changes that will uh, allow everybody an opportunity to find the information that they need to with regards to uh, or in advance of uh, today's meeting and stuff that uh, will help, but. The main one would be the bylaws. I think the bylaws are on the website, aren't they? They are, I, but they're not in a easy to find format. It's it it took. Yes, me I've a, heard that complaint about the website a few times that things are hard to find. And that's and maybe and then I really like the idea of the Canada One Fiftieth, and uh, I'm writing a choose your own adventure web page right now that I'm, uh, and I think that there's a lot of people that have uh, artistic talent and having a contest or something like that that uh, would be to get more people involved and make people aware of what CIRA is and what uh, Canadian domain names are like. Uh, the last question I actually had was uh, with regards to some of the things that uh, are the initiatives you guys are doing um, with uh, not the dot ca but uh it was talked about um dot kiwi i guess it is or uh what i wanted to know are are you working with that um domain i guess the dot kiwi domain or is it that these are people who register that type of domain would be a part of sira and would be eligible and and no. do you plan on, will it specifically be .ca people that are members of, uh, or that no. are eligible to vote? No. Okay. They'll, they'll be operating, we, we'd be operating the, like, the, the back shop. They run their own. Mm. Do, they run their own. So it's not, we're not doing a merger. Or we're, yeah. we're a service provider. That's what I Running figured. a technical registry. Great. Hello. Um, yes. My name is Hisham Kadumi. I'm an IT expert. Um, I would like to say something that um, I've been around the world a lot uh, during the past few years, and the number of Canadians who work abroad, and, and, like really expertise, is really shocking. I mean, there are a lot of them working in all the fields. Uh, one of them is specifically the IT. I've met a lot of them working there. And it's uh, talking back to Mr. Holland when he said that. Sierra was looking for a lot of experts and they couldn't find them because maybe most of them are outside. Uh, is there any strategy for Sierra to, you know, to involve more Canadians in, uh, into these kind of, you know, whatever we have? We have a lot of issues to, uh, to actually address in the future, like cybersecurity or uh, fighting cyber crimes or a lot of things. And we need a lot of people to work onto this. And maybe we can also work for them to advise the government and not just leave it to some politicians to, uh, to decide for these things. You know, we need to play more role for CIRA 
in, 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 in a lot of things, you know, we not just leave it to, to the government. And for that, we need a lot of them, of these people, to come and be in, really involved in, into this, building those strategies or, or, or I don't know, maybe like uh, uh, making some kind of, of, uh, of sheets for the governments so that we'll tell them, this is gonna be good, this is gonna be bad, this is the ramification of these kind of, 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 uh, of laws that you're gonna put or something like that. So do you have anything like this for that? Um, well, without expanding on our purposes at length, um, I, I think I'll turn this to Byron to describe, you know, what activities he undertakes in the international context, because I think that's partly what your question is about. Um, and perhaps he heard some element of it that I didn't quite hear. So we'll start there. Sure. Um, you're right. There are many, many highly talented, experienced, and expert Canadians working out in the IT field globally. Uh, much of what I do ends up being in the global realm, so I see them frequently out there. And based on the technical community we have in our own shop, Steve, Jacques, others, um, we know the community very well who has expertise in the things that we do. Uh, in terms of talent management per se, we absolutely do have an ongoing strategy, be it acquisition, maintenance, or retention of high quality talent. It's something that I think every IT organization wrestles with. We continue to wrestle with it, but it is absolutely a top of mind and top priority activity within the organization. Um, part of our challenge is we require very deep expertise in very specific technologies. And some of the challenges, there's just not a lot of those folks around. Uh, and they're highly prized, highly sought after, and their skill set is in demand globally. So we have to compete against all those other actors, employers, who are looking for those narrow, deep, highly experienced uh, employees. But it's a constant, it is honestly, it's a constant challenge and something we're constantly evolving our strategies and tactics around. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid we have to conclude now. Um, in, because we only have an annual general meeting once a year, I'm very reluctant to ever cut off questions and commentary, but uh, I think I've probably exhausted people's patience because I'm well over time. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming out today, and not only that, for being an engaged group and for your questions, comments, and insights. Um, which we have taken under, under advisement. Um, it's, so it's now time to adjourn the official portion of the meeting and I would like a motion to conclude the meeting. Uh, so could I have someone make that motion please? Thank you, could you state your name please? Thank you Marita. And could I have a seconder for that motion? Yes ma'am. Could you state your name? The lady right there. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, would all those in favor please raise your voting card now? And if you're on the webcast, could you please vote now? And I, again, apologize, we'll have to wait. Um, okay. That definitely looks like a majority of the people in the room. So this should be the last time that you have to wait for these votes to come in, so um, we'll just give it a few minutes. I'm also aware that I'm cutting into, your, into the last speaker and your uh, social time, so. I'll um, just, because this seems to be taking a few minutes, I'll just use these few minutes um, to read you a quote from one of our community investment program recipients. As you may have gathered, this is a program we're extremely proud of. Um, the following comes from Kate Arthur, the founder and executive director of Kids Code Jeunesse. 
With the Community Investment Program, Kids Code Jeunesse has been able to grow from an idea into a nationwide organization that supports thousands of children and teachers with computer programming in the education system. As one of our founding supporters, the Community Investment Team has become part of our organization and encouraged us every step of the way. It's comments like these that remind us of what the funding for the Community Investment Program is doing for Canadian communities, and although the program is relatively new in our history, it's one of which we're extremely proud and constantly looking to enhance and improve um, to build a better online Canada. So we're, we're still collecting online votes. I don't think this thing's 40 seconds. <laughs> so I ran a full hour almost over. Okay. I think we lost most of our online participants. A six out of 33 voted online to adjourn. However, given the majority in the room, I declare the meeting adjourned. <laughs>